Well, hello everyone. Welcome to instructional course number 65. Uh, my name is Dave Brianza. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this session, Amy Bjornsson, and Amy will be talking about the seat cushion microclimate uh, and the importance of microclimate at the seating interface. Um, just before uh, Amy gets started, I just wanted to let everyone know I will give you the CE code at the conclusion of the session. And we'll be using the chat for questions, so please enter your questions um, when they come to you during the presentation. I'll be keeping track of those questions and we'll probably handle those during the last 10 minutes of the session. And so, Amy, I will turn it over to you. Perfect. Thanks, Dave. Welcome, everyone. Um, obviously, I'd rather, rather be there in person with you, uh, but I am beaming across due to the greatness of Zoom platform from Sydney, Australia, where I am in the future. Um, I can see the future. It's about seven in the morning on Wednesday here. So indeed, today we're going to be talking about that microclimate at the seating interface, um, primarily at the cushion interface, but realize that this also applies uh, to the back support surface as well. Um, a little bit of background on me. I'm a, a physical therapist by background, um, did my work in my initial uh, uh, academic career, I guess uh, you'll say in the United States, um, joined Sunrise Medical in their clinical education in the U.S. before uh, moving to uh, Sydney, Australia, where I'm the clinical director here, uh, based again out of Sydney. Um, we know that this microclimate um, pressure uh, injury problem is, um, you know, independent of what kind of disability, what level of spinal injury, what kind of disability. Um, it occurs um, more than we'd like to think about is, I believe that skin injuries are completely 100% preventable, but how do we make it happen? How do we prevent these injuries? Um, before we get really into the depths of it, let's make sure that we're all on the same page about what we're talking about. Um, microclimate, what do we mean? What are we referring to? And this was a, a word that came about in the 1950s to describe really any microcosm or any climatic condition in a small area. Um, in our space, in more of the complex rehab space, we're going to deem the microclimate as um, the mini atmosphere um, anywhere where there is contact with that seating surface. And again, that will entail uh, the seat cushion, the back cushion, I didn't mention the headrest before, um, but that mini um, atmosphere of contact. Okay. And the microclimate, we need to consider not only temperature, but we obviously need to consider the moisture and the humidity of that contact. Um, there's lots of studies out there. I'll show you the references at the end about how an adverse uh, microclimate can really increase tissue deformation and, uh, and uh, increase their risk. And so we've started looking at this more and more, probably I would say over the last decade, um, Geffen and Kottner um, referenced here, um, indicated that that microclimate is an uh, indirect uh, risk vector to skin injury, skin breakdown. Um, I'm sure we're all very well versed in how uh, common this avoidable uh, injury is. The incidence of pressure injuries is very high and we know it's because they have limited mobility. They're sitting for a long time, uh, often in a static population. Uh, referenced here amongst the spinal cord injury population, um, it's 23 to 40%, and probably higher than that because it's not reported. Um, and um, sometime within their lifetime, generally we believe that 95% will have an incidence um, after their injury. Uh, it's well established the risks, the, the extrinsic risks um, from pressure and shear forces. Um, but now again, in the last uh, five years, 10 years, we're really starting to look at that microclimate. So now also including that moisture, um, humidity and temperature. So not only do we need to be considering pressure and shear, um, but we also need to think about that microclimate to fully protect the skin. So when we think about um, pressure and its relation to the microclimate, 
We know that an increase in the interface pressure, either peak pressures or overall pressures, um, reduces the blood flow to the places that are getting the most pressure. Typically, that's going to be your ischial tuberosities and the sacrum. Okay, and we know that any increase in that pressure is going to reduce um, the blood flow and therefore decrease the oxygenation. Uh, we also know that a higher skin temperature has a dramatic effect on metabolism. So for every increase in uh, body or that surface temperature, one degree Celsius here, we know that that metabolic uh, demand is 10% higher. So if we're thinking about that interface uh, temperature, that microclimate at a seat cushion on a hot day in Tampa, or here in Sydney where we're in summer, um, all of a sudden that oxygen, demand, that oxygen demand is really increasing. So we need to think about that temperature in order to de decrease the, the overall um, uh, oxygen demands, if you will. There's been lots of studies looking at this um, across industries. A lot of them came out of the um, bed support surface industry. Um, again, these are referenced at the end, but um, studies have found that lowering that skin temperature by five degrees can produce the same tissue protection as by the um, like an air or low air loss mattress, the most expensive support surfaces. Further studies have found that reducing that skin temperature at the sacrum, again, at another place of high risk by three degrees, is equivalent to a decrease in 14% of the interface pressure. Okay, so we can't discount temperature, moisture, humidity at that seating interface. Further study said uh, cooling skin from 36 to 28 degrees Celsius. Again, that's a, a big drop but is estimated to be equivalent to reducing interface pressure by a third, right? So we can put more tools in our toolbox. Don't just think about pressure, immersion, and development, but also think about reducing the, the overall seating interface temperature. Uh, we've also found, again, through various industries and, and uh, research studies that increasing that skin temperature actually decreases the body's ability to protect it. So if we see an increase in skin temperature, there's a decline in its resistance to damage. We also know that if the skin is a higher temperature and at a higher humidity, it affects the structure and the function of this connective tissue in the skin and lowers the damage thresholds for not only sort of the top layer of the epidermis, but also the underlining dermis. Uh, it also has a big effect on friction um, friction is that uh, coefficient is five times greater when there is moisture present. And we know there's going to be moisture present if we have a higher temperature due to perspiration. Um, I guess I'll take just another definition step here. Um, I think of shear as tangential forces where the skin is being pulled, the skin surface is being um, pulled and stretched um, on a non movable surface, that's it, seating interface. Whereas friction is more everybody's moving um, and it's that um, stick is what we're talking about here um, and creating those um, deformation forces. We do know that the more friction between the skin and the, and the interface material, the greater the risk of that harmful deformation, tissue damage, maybe not at the surface, but the underlining uh, dermal tissues. Um, talk a little bit about humidity and what the difference is between absolute humidity and relative humidity. Um, that humidity or the, the moisture is going to affect again the connective tissue underlining um, and the stratum corneum is one that has been looked at at a relative humidity of 100%, so pretty high, but um, exactly where our humidity is here in Sydney, it's 25 times weaker than at 50% humidity. Okay. And absolute humidity, we're going to um, define that as the, the measure, the, abs, uh, the actual water vapor that's in the air at that given time. Okay. Whereas relative humidity is that water vapor, the moisture in the air, relative or taking into account the air temperature. So relative humidity is going to go higher as your temperature increases. So again, these things all piggyback on one another, making the risk sort of increase exponentially. 
We know that this humidity at the, at the surface softens that connective tissue and it reduces the, um, the relative elasticity of the tissue and allowing more deformation, more damage to occur um, throughout the skin layers. Another consideration is, is um, humidity actually removes the natural oils that lubricate and help protect the skin and help with the uh, elasticity. So um, might be sort of counterintuitive here, but that skin actually is a little bit, um, uh, the oils within it are reduced when we have um, a higher humidity. So again, now we have to think about not only the, the absolute temperature, but we have to think about the humidity and how the humidity is also affected by higher temperatures and that relative humidity. When we're talking about moisture and, and um, humidity, we also need to consider what might be um, increased in the moisture at that seating interface. So it's not just intrinsic into the client themselves, um, with sweat and perhaps incontinence, but also drainage from any wounds, drainage from uh, tube feeding, um, also the interface materials and their ability to wick off anything that's been uh, dropped. So moisture from drinking, moisture from eating, um, all of those things will, will create that extra moisture and humidity at, at the interface. Uh, again, I think we're very well versed in, in strategies for protecting the skin. We're very good at um, decreasing pressure and increasing um, pressure reliefs throughout the day, whether that be by the person actually doing that pressure relief or by um, maybe power seat functions or uh, dynamic tilt and space in a manual chair. We think about repositioning, doing weight shifts, providing pressure reliefs uh, commonly throughout the day, every 30 minutes, every 15 minutes, redistributing that weight. While we're doing those pressure reliefs and the redistributions, obviously we're introducing airflow and hopefully allowing some of that moisture to dissipate. Okay. Um, we maximize the distribution of this pressure by uh, you know, making sure that people are immersing and enveloping into the cushion material, perhaps that we choice. Okay. Um, also making sure that we've reduced shear forces so there aren't those shear forces and pulling and the deformation. But we also, as we said, and I think one of the very first slides, pressure, increased pressure itself also increases that surface temperature, increasing metabolic demand. So making sure that it's very important to, to get those peak pressures and mean pressures um, down as far as you can. But again, the last bit here, or the maybe not, but newer options are influencing and changing that microclimate, allowing the heat that's created to dissipate, allow the moisture that's been created to, to dissipate away from that seated interface. Um, so we'll start to talk a little bit about materials. Um, and many of our materials at the complex level of seating here are, are multiple. So we have a foam um, or a structural base, and maybe we have a fluid um, for the immersion and the envelopment. So just make sure you're looking at each of the materials of the cushion um, in, in what it's providing in terms of postural support, pressure relief, and also in, um, influencing that microclimate. So lots of studies out there have been done. Um, some of them dispute um, what others have said, but majority of the studies um, demonstrate a lower skin temperature at that microsurface um, um, with a gel material when, when compared to foam or air. And gel meaning um, the immersive um, fluid type of gel uh, versus uh, um, like the, the, the solid material gel, like an action gel. Um, foam, condition, um, foam cushions do produce a lower um, relative humidity when compared to other surfaces. And we have also found that foam may be superior in the moisture management. Um, again, really looking at what the um, materials are being used for posturally and pressure relief wise as well as looking at the cushion cover materials because that's the direct interface, um, obviously. 
you're starting to look at what cushions you want to trial um, to provide, you know, the postural support, the pressure relief, the microclimate management that you need. Um, make sure that you're looking at um, the materials and also the design, particularly the shape um, of those cushions um, to make sure that you're maximizing your strategies for skin protection. So with the cushion itself, the materials, um, is the cushion full contact? Is it form fitting? Is it making a mold of their bottom? Um, is it immersive? Are they immersing and, and getting in, enveloped into that material? Because if it does, it's going to be really good in terms of its pressure distribution, but it's not gonna have a lot of good airflow. So you might need to have the, the heat and the moisture reduction strategies in the cushion cover, okay? Or change how they're doing their pressure relief, the frequency, the duration. Um, is the cushion material able to dissipate heat appropriate to how the client, their overall body temperature, and also take into consideration the climate in which they live? If somebody is in, you know, high up Wisconsin, we're probably less concerned, at least during the winter time, than somebody that's living down in the bottom of, of Florida or elsewhere. Um, for the people that are in these higher risk categories, um, consider active cooling strategies of this cushion. Um, uh, active cooling, I'll talk a little bit about the cryogel. Um, there are also some, some fan-based um, that, are, that are pushing cooler air um, into cushions or, or backrests. So think of ways of, of using active cooling strategies within the, within the cushion itself and its technology. Um, covers, again, are very, very important as it's the first place of contact between the client and the seated interface. And they do play um, a big role in this microclimate. It's been well studied and continues to be studied. Not only does the, the material and the amount of that material influence um, the moisture and the moisture creation, but certain materials, as I just uh, discussed before, um, have a different heat generating quality. And also realize that um, the cover is very important in this role of protecting the materials underneath. It protects the cushions, the fluids, the foams um, from you know, daily use, from moisture that's generated from the body. Um, also, I guess something that's not on the slide here is a lot of times the cushion cover will also um, uh, provide a vessel for any of the more uh, dynamic uh, materials that are that are underneath. So holds the air into place if you're using an air cushion. It holds the fluid into place if, if you're using a dynamic uh, fluid cushion. Um, we do have options. Some of the more typical options are here on the screen. Um, top left is your micro um, or your uh, antibacterial cushion cover. We're starting to weave um, ionic or um, uh, uh, silver fibers into the cushion cover, various locations uh, to stop the bacteria um, from binding and creating colonies, um, creating odors. Okay. Um, top right would be your wicking cover. So this is allowing a layer of air to flow even when the client is sitting on the cushion. Um, so that even, um, you know, when they're not able to do a pressure relief, there will be some amount of airflow, uh, dissipation of that moisture. Realizing that um, the cushions can use different amounts, varying uh, uh, densities and even amount of that wicking fabric. Uh, waterproof cushions or, or dark text in, um, cushions are really about keeping any moisture from the underlining materials the foam, the, the fluids that are in the bases of the cushion themselves. And then we can also have an incontinent protection layer, if you will, that happens generally to the underside of the cushion cover. And again, this um, really doesn't allow any of the moisture, however that's created, um, to seep into the materials underneath. If we look at those um, cushion covers more in depth, um, Think about again what their positives are and what uh, maybe some of the considerations of those um, cushion covers are. We know that incontinent or 
um, fully wipeable cushions are easy to care for. They're good to use in between clients because you can wipe them off, um, and make sure they're, they're clean and, and safe for the next person to use. But, but it's really providing, its main aim is to provide a barrier between um, any moisture um, and the material below seeping into that and ruining the foam or degrading, reducing the, the longevity of it. That moisture is going to remain on the surface of the cushion, and that's where the client is sitting. So ask yourself, how well is that, you know, is it doing a good enough job protecting the client um, from that uh, moisture, the humidity that's being created? Also, a lot of these, um, especially the fully wipeable covers, um, have a reduced stretch, four-way stretch. So make sure that um, that cover is allowing the client to immerse, um, be enveloped in that material underneath. Um, stretch covers um, are good all around cover. If you have uh, risk of skin breakdown, um, you have some heat, um, most of these are a good stretch. They're gonna allow immersion envelopment into that material underneath, but they're not protecting the materials underneath, okay? And it's just a, a general sort of cover. If we look towards a wicking or some what we call a microclimatic cover, um, this is going to be one step um, more in, in reducing the heat and temperature moisture um, at that surface because it's, it's really trying to wick the moisture away from the surface um, through that um, spacer fabric. Um, and again, I talked about with the last slide, we have varying amounts um, and maybe heights of, of that material. So make sure if you are using a microclimatic cover that you are um, able to immerse fully into that material underneath. So is it giving you the pressure redistribution that's required, okay? Because remember, we really have four pillars of, of skin protection that we're trying to hit here. And then that silver ion impregnated cover, uh, again, just really trying to uh, act as an antimicrobial. Um, so that we get rid of uh, um, the buildup of bacteria and the odors that happen after that. Uh, most of these um, were just impregnating and already stretch cover, so you don't need to um, worry about the, the reduction in any of your four-way stretch. When we're thinking about the cushion cover, um, again, think about what the risk level of your client is, maybe the risk level of the climate in which they're living. Is it able to passively, and right now um, we don't have any active cooling uh, cushion covers, so it's all gonna happen passively through air exchange. So is this cover able to passively dissipate the heat and reduce the amount of moisture created for what's required at the for the client and the climate? Does it have the um, necessary wicking capability um, for your sweaters, um, uh, people that are hotter, you might want to increase that wicking capability in your in your cover selection. Do think about the permeability. Obviously, those incontinent covers, um, the wipeable covers, are going to have a reduced permeability, so that that air is just not going to, or the the moisture is not going to dissipate. Okay. Um, we did introduce a J fusion with cryo cushion um, a couple of years ago in the US. And this cushion was all about trying to actively help with the temperature at that seating interface. So it's the fusion um, through and through. We just changed the fluid uh, in the bladder here. So in, in how this is helping protect the skin, you'll see that it has um, the J technology built into the base. We are loading the pressure in, uh, tolerant areas, the femur, the greater trochanter. We're offloading the um, places that are at risk, uh, the ischial tuberosities, the sacrum, the coccyx, and that's all by the shape of the J well that we're all very familiar with. We're reducing the sliding forces providing good postural support by the ischial shelf. And again, the, the shape of that well. We've got a soft foam on the top of that fusion so that we further immerse, envelop. We're also a more comfortable cushion for clients with sensation. And then we put the cryo fluid in the bladder and I'll describe that in the next slides. So that is the active cooling property of this cushion. We're able to decrease that surface of the fluid bladder 
55 degrees. In addition, um, the cushion cover is using those passive um, cooling and wicking strategies I talked about in the previous slides. We're using the, um, the microclimatic fiber so that there's airflow, there's permeability. We're using the um, silver impregnated cover materials to make sure that the bacteria can't bind. So here we're really offering sort of the four pillars of skin protection, pressure relief, shear relief, temperature reduction, moisture reduction, okay, and that relative humidity reduction. So let's see how that works. Um, unlike our typical J cushions, in these microbeads that are uh, in the typical J fluid better, uh, in the cryo cushion, we fill them with paraffin. And paraffin is, is actually a, a solid at room temperature. But um, with the heat of the body, you can see in my schematic here that heat of the body is actually going to take that um, hotter surface and then um, come in contact with those um, micro micro beads in the bladder itself. And then there's a basically a conduction reaction where those paraffin beads pull the heat out of the body tissue, causing a reduction at that seating interface by upwards of five degrees. Uh, there's a little bit of graphite in there so that we can use the entirety of that fluid bladder to cool that surface for up to eight hours. So this is an active um, conduction reaction where we're pulling that heat away from the surface, drawing it into the cushion, um, again, creating that active cooling effect. The bladder is um, separated into four sections so that we can um, allow for immersion and development and the cooling in the area that uh, are the areas that are most at risk, the ischial tuberosities. So um, just a little bit of a uh, slide here on how this works and what temperature uh, reduction is available within the J uh, cryo technology. Let me orient you to this sort of busy slide here. So we have seated interface temperature on the y-axis here. And sorry for those of you still working in Fahrenheit, um, this is in Celsius, okay. And um, along the x-axis, we have time. So 843 and then upwards of um, 1643, so 4 p.m. in the afternoon. Um, you'll see when the client first sits on this cushion, the majority of the um, cushions are right around 32 degrees. And then immediately we find an increase in the pressure, uh, sorry, increase in the temperature with um, a foam cushion, with a typical J fluid cushion, and with an air cushion. That foam cushion is the yellow line. And our J fluid cushion is the orange line. And then the air cushion. You'll see a pretty dramatic rise upwards through an hour and a half, two hours. And then here at my um, timestamp here at, at five degrees Celsius, we're at about five hours, okay? So you see that increase in, in temperature and then a relative uh, plateauing off. And increase, um, interesting here in that a lot of these cushion materials react differently, but get to a very um, similar um, overall uh, temperature. As I stated before, we typically find that foam cushions um, are a little bit uh, higher temperature than um, a, a comparable fluid, um, either a, a fluid, jelly fluid cushion or an air cushion. If we then compare that to the J with cryo, you'll see an immediate drop. And in fact, when you sit on this cushion, um, it will feel cool to the touch because all of those micro beads are now going from you know, a solid material to a fluid, drawing the most heat away from that seated interface. And we see that nice drop of um, temperature from that seated surface. There's about one degree for about five hours. And if we do a comparison between the cryo and the other cushions, we see at that five hour mark that we're five degrees Celsius cooler at the seated interface, realizing, right? 
And then as we have less active cooling with those paraffin beads, you'll see that the temperature um, starts to rise. But even after that eight hour period, we're still about two degrees cooler than those comparison cushions. This is showing me that we can use this technology to reduce that surface temperature and therefore reduce you know, the, the oxygen demand, reduce the, uh, the moisture at that interface, and therefore that's also going to reduce your relative humidity. Um, we've had some really good success with people that have um, had you know, long-standing um, skin breakdowns that they haven't been able to heal. They've used all sorts of different cushions. They've tried all sorts of different th things, um, but it was that last pillar, that moisture, the temperature, the humidity, um, management that that allowed their skin to um, stay healthy. Uh, recently had a, a woman wearing jeans, couldn't get her out of her jeans, had had um, sort of a grade two um, problem for four or five years and, and has finally healed up um, while using uh, the cryo technology. Just that moisture is a, a, a really key pillar. So in the last moments here of, of the presentation, I'd like to think about um, particular diagnoses or disabilities that this might be most appropriate for. Um, multiple sclerosis, we, we do know that um, they experience uh, transient or temporary worsening of, of symptoms um, when their body temperature is higher. Um, when we find that they're two, three degrees higher body core temperature, um, they do seem to have more uh, spasticity, reduction in their motor control. Uh, we also know that fatigue is a big symptom um, with MS, and this does worsen with thermal stress. Um, additionally, consider that your multiple sclerosis patients um, probably have impaired sweat glands, so intrinsically they're not able to manage their body temperature, uh, so they're probably going to be warmer as the ambient temperature or their activity uh, level increases. So I think MS is a particular client that might help from uh, this reduction of that surface temperature. Not only to consider you know, moisture and, and pressure influence. If we look at spinal cord injuries, uh, we know just based on, on their neurologic insult that they do have difficulty regulating their body temperatures and that this uh, thermal regulation, thermal um, information stream is impaired below the level of their injury. So if they're not getting the, in, the information from below the level of the injury about how hot they are, that also means that their um, body's response to that increased uh, temperature is going to be slowed or dramatically impaired. So their sweat glands aren't gonna kick in and help cool the body. We also know that they have a higher risk for overheating during exercise, probably because of that reduced response to the changes in body temperature. But there's some really good um, studies out there saying that um, during exercise, an increase in the body temperature um, between able-bodied and SEI clients, that the SEI clients were at a greater risk um, for that disturbed heat balance, both in the cold and in the heat, um, so that we need to, to understand that their body is not going to self-regulate their body temperature. So anything that we can do with that seating interface uh, will, help, um, will help, help this problem. Um, in the bariatric population, we know they're at higher risk for skin integrity issues um, because that, that extra fatty tissue isn't well oxygenated, there's poor blood supply. So they're already at a risk for pressure injuries just due to the lack of oxygenation. Um, we find that they typically have a poor nutrition when they're compared to normal weight individuals. They're gonna have higher moisture at those seated interface because they have a higher body temperature, they're exerting extra effort. So there's going to be um, a likelihood of more moisture maceration problems. Uh, we also know that they will typically have um, skin folds. They might have difficulty cleaning, keeping these areas dry, might have bacteria and fungi issues. Okay. Added to all of this, um, their immobility or uh, tendency to sit for longer periods of time, inability to do a good pressure relief, puts them again in that really high risk category where they could really benefit 
from that active cooling strategy and thinking about the microclimate. Uh, cerebral palsy. Um, you know, normally we see cerebral palsy clients with more immersive um, contoured seating systems. So there's going to be a reduction in the airflow. So they have higher moisture, higher sweating issues. Um, typically we'll see higher spasticity. So we might have an introduction of um, higher shear forces. We're gonna deform that tissue, putting us in that higher risk category. Uh, we also know that uh, CP um, probably neurologically tend to cope um, poorly with higher temperatures. And they have a, um, similar to the spinal cord injury population, they have a, a slow or a diminished response to heat stresses. Again, if we have all these higher risk categories in pressure, in shear, um, lower airflow, uh, we have to think about how we can manage the temperatures of the interface in active cooling strategy ways. As uh, discussed, um, references here are all included. I will put the presentation up on the platform uh, later on this morning, um, but these are some of the references used and notated in, uh, in the presentation. And I thank you very much for your attendance. Um, I know you had lots of choices today. Have a great rest of the conference. Um, I will now open up uh, to any questions. Dave, anything come through in the chat? Thank you, Amy. Yes, we have a number of questions and comments in the chat, and I've, I've kind of put them together in groups here for you. Um, the first had to do with, um, you know, talking about materials and fabrics, and, and you, you talked about this after the question um, was asked, but I will just ask um, Erica, who asked that question, if there was any follow-up, and I have enabled um, everyone to, to be able to unmute themselves, so... Okay. Erica, if there's anything else um, you'd like to follow up on the materials. She said no. Okay. And uh, let me just um, comment on that. Um, you know, obviously, um, we're, we're asking cushions and seating surfaces to do a lot for us. Um, you know, pressure relief, shear relief, positioning, uh, functional aspects, transfers. Um, we also have to think about the maintenance and what I call the smart value. How smart do you have to be to use this seat cushion, this backrest? And the crazy thing is all four of those are equally as important. You know, it has to provide the pressure relief that we want and the positioning, but it can't be too hard to use and it can't be too hard to clean and it can't be too hard to get on and off of. So that's when we find that we really have to um, make concerted decisions about you know, what materials can offer what, and, and then mix and match those materials to suit that client's life. So a question um, sort of related to this had to do with specifically foam cushions. And so um, the person who asked this question said, well, you know, foam are, foams are generally closed cell. And so they don't um, transmit moisture and they don't um, allow for airflow. Um, some most actually most cushions are, are open cell, but they still don't don't transmit moisture and then have airflow, uh, much airflow. But in that in that case, can't the cover compensate for the cushion material and and provide the same functionality, even though the cushion materials are in, in, uh, inadequate? Sure, and I guess that goes back to my last comment: is that you know if if um, your your cushion is really immersive while you're gonna have higher temperatures there and maybe just based on the foam materials that you're using, well, can you compensate with the cover materials, right? So we tend to mix and match to hopefully meet the goals of the entirety of the cushion and back support. So yes, um, there, I think there's a lot of coordination, compensation, consideration throughout all of the materials. Um, someone else asked if you could just um, comment on the effect moisture may have in terms of degrading foam over time? Again, it depends on the type of foam, um, but I guess a, a easy statement would be that moisture really degrades foam, you know, independent of what kind it is. So, and again, that's, that's part of the balancing act. We know that we use incontinent um, cushion covers to protect the cover, uh, to protect the cushion, right? But it might be reducing its 
you know, it's microclimate capabilities, it's, it's um, pressure reduction capabilities. So can you gather other pressure relieving qualities from the base and then be okay with using an incontinent cover? Right. I mean, there are a lot of covers that will um, prevent liquid from going through, but they will still allow water vapor to pass through and, yep. and the water yep. vapor could, could recondense inside the cushion and become liquid again. Mm. Um, so there was a couple questions about the, um, the methods that of your, for your data collection and in particular mm -hmm. how the temperature and moisture were recorded. And I guess I would add where they were recorded to that question. Sure. Um, first of all, we did not um, do moisture. This is just temperature in the data that was, that was shown. Um, and it was um, surface temperature by uh, surface pads at the ischial tuberosities. So between the interface of the cushion itself and the client. And they were uh, temperature gauges that were used for that uh, time frame. Um, we do have some studies happening here in Australia that are um, comparing cushions. So um, foam cushions, fluid cushions, air cushions, um, looking at surface temperature, looking at body temperature, looking at relative moisture, and then also a subjective um, comfort uh, qualification, I guess I'll say. Uh, so those um, studies are being done by an independent university here and um, results are pending. Great. Um, for the people who asked those questions, did you have any follow-up to those on the temperature moisture recording method? Be good to know the moisture, the relative uh, moisture at that interface as well, and that'll be sort of next stages. Yeah. So there were a few questions about the um, the materials, the the cryo in, materials in the cryo insert, mm -hmm. and um, one one question one person asked if um, if after all the paraffin microbeads have melted, does the cooling um, does cooling them down again reverse the process and recreate the microbeads, or does do you have to dispose of it? No, no. Um, yes, after you um, come off of that cushion, those microbeads will uh, re recreate that solid material. And I shouldn't say solid because it's still a, a viscous and um, it's still an immersive cushion, but it goes back to its cooling state after you know. Depends on how how hot the cushion got or if all those paraffin beads. Um, went to a fluid form, um, but generally it'll it'll reset overnight, so an eight hour period. And related to that, how long does this material last? Does the performance degrade over time? Um, it would be very typical to a regular J fluid. Um, the uh, I guess the warranty period for that cushion is two years. Um, typically, we'll see that fluid, uh, if well cared for, last for four years, five years. So you could imagine that this cryofluid is very typical of your experience with a regular J fluid. And when I say well cared for, um, the things that age fluid the most is incontinence and huge temperature fluctuations. So don't leave it outside at, at night in the winter. Don't leave it in the hot um, trunk of your car. Do you know if the um, heat absorption characteristics change within those conditions? in really when, hot when it's, when it's subjected to um, either extreme cold or extreme heat or after a long period of time. Sure. Um, definitely if it extremes in temperature, because let's say you were using this, um, you know, a hundred plus day outside, it would already, that surface temperature would already be higher. So you'd have less cooling capability. Um, the other direction, uh, not so much. Um, uh, be, because those beads are at, at that temperature already. So, but at the extremes of, of high temperatures, yes, it would be less able to cool. And so um, someone was asking if you sell the cryo um, packets separately, so someone could replace it after two years when it might, wear, might be you know, past its lifetime. Sure, yes, that bladder would be replaceable. Um, as a part, just like any other J cushion. Um, uh, we are only putting the cryofluid at this point into um, the J fusion. Mm -hmm. So that's the cushion that's available on. Um, Jillian, did you have any follow up to that? You can unmute if you like. 
Now, my question was more, I guess, just on the funding and also the replacement of what she just said. So just curious in terms of the difference in price and if the suppliers are finding it uh, you know, worth their while to provide this cushion or if we need to do further justification to get it for our clients. And then with yeah. the two-year warranty, is the client able to get a new fluid pack from Sunrise after two years versus the five years from replacing a full cushion? Gotcha. Um, I'll answer the last question first. Um, yes, that would be like if they had a fusion now and they want to introduce this cooling effect, you would be able to put in the fluid bladder from a cryo into their existing cushion, no problem. Um, in regards to the funding, um, although I have an American accent, um, I've been out of the States for sort of 10 years. So, um, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't know sort of the experience of the suppliers. It is um, an increased price. Um, I actually don't know how much more it is when you compare it to the fusion in the US. Um, I believe that we need to justify all of what we're providing. So definitely you would need further justification that your client is um, at risk for skin breakdowns, not only due to pressure and shear, but also that microclimate, talk about temperature, talk about moisture, da, 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 da. Um, I do know that Sunrise has a virtual booth and they'd be happy to, to talk about suppliers um, experiences. Um, I do know here in Australia um, that we're, we're selling it quite well, um, but we do need to justify our clinical reasoning needs to um, in, include why a normal fusion cushion or Roho or, or whatever um, wouldn't do the job and they need to make sure that they're mentioning microclimate, temperature, moisture risk. Do you know if you're getting reimbursed at a higher price or yeah, 100%. Yeah. Okay. So they're not just reimbursing a standard skin protection positioning. They're giving more. For this yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's a different, a different system here. So um, uh, it would be justified based on what it's offering. And then it would either be approved or not approved. So it doesn't need to meet a particular code, but the theory and the, and the practice is much the same. Someone mentioned that they use the Sunrise J SureFit system and um, frequently, and that they um, were asking if there was a foam configuration that was best suited for that cushion for temperature control. Uh, well, then, you know, especially if you're contouring it, um, uh, you'll need to consider that that foam material is warmer, creates more heat, and has a harder time dissipating that heat. So can you use a, a cover material? So a wicking material, a microclimatic cover um, to help mitigate that. Um, also, you'll need to think about increased pressure relief strategies, uh, making sure that you can get as much airflow as, as possible. Um, what I would love is to have some of this fluid technology come into other products. Um, so if you guys, um, Tell your suppliers, hey, we love this cryo stuff, but we want it in other products um, that will help my cause. <laughs> so I could see it really being used in some pediatric cushions and um, in some lower um, pressure relieving cushions as well for the spinal injury guys. Um, somebody asked about the environmental conditions during the test for the data that you presented. And they wondered if the, um, the room temperature during that test was lower. And, and if so, would would the um, cryofluid work as long in a higher temperature, in a higher uh, environment where there's higher temperature? Yeah, um, I haven't looked at the data for what the actual temperature was in the room in a while, so wouldn't want to give you a, an actual temperature, but it was typical room temperature. You know, it wasn't particularly cooled by air conditioning. Um, um, so just think it would be normal sort of office environment. Uh, but again, as I think I mentioned before, Yes, it would be influenced. Um, it would have a reduction in its capability if you were in a hot environment. Not fully, not back to a, you know, a normal cushion, but um, you would be starting at um, um, with some of that paraffin already being in a warm state, I guess I'll say. Great. Um, somebody was um, responding to something you said earlier in the presentation about um, cushions um, with fans. 
and and this person said that they're aware of a, a back product that has a fan but are there studies ongoing with the fan technology in the seat cushion not that i know of uh, it seems like a lot of that fan technology um, has has been tricky like you'll see a product for a while and it won't do well either because it's too cumbersome the battery technology wasn't there um, maybe too expensive or everything com combined but um, I think the more work we do and the more um, more work we do in understanding that microclimate is really important, the more research will go into it. And I, and I think even with better technology becoming better and less expensive, I'm hoping to see more active cooling and even heating um, uh, seating technology in the future. Uh, somebody else asked about um, materials. Um, that are moisture wicking and incontinent covers, what are they typically made of? Uh, in the incontinent? Right, so, wicking, they're, they're, so asking, both. they're asking what materials are the moisture wicking covers made of and what materials are the incontinent covers typically made of? Such one. Uh, again, it depends on the manufacturer. Um, a lot of uh, Sunrise's wicking material is um, um, thread materials, if you will. It's like a, um, a, a plastic threaded material. Probably not a great description of it. But basically, it'll, um, it allows the cushion cover. I'll just go back real quick. Um, it allows the cushion cover material not to fully compress. And so there's a, a layer of air um, flow that happens there. Um, sort of a, a webbing material. That's what a lot of the, the wicking or the microclimatic materials would be made out of. Um, in terms of the incontinent protection, Sunrise will coat the inside to provide that incontinent protection. And it's just an impermeable um, uh, layer there so that the moisture doesn't seep through into the cushion. Okay. Um, someone um, was re reacting to your um, saying that these cushions are not available uh, in pediatric sizes, but what is the small size available? It would uh, go down oh, to a 14. That. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, um, you know, it's in small sizes, but it would be the fusion, so it wouldn't be the other pediatric cushions. Um, that, those were the questions I saw in the chat, but um, we have a few minutes left. So if anybody has any further questions or comments, um, please unmute yourself and uh, ask away. Lots of uh, compliments in the, in the chat. Very, very nice presentation. Really appreciate you being here. Good to virtually see all of you. I hope everyone's done well and hopefully next ISS will all be together. How about that as a plan? Sounds good to me. I think the last thing for me to do is to give the CEU code, which I will do it in the chat. And I will also tell you in case you're not seeing the chat, the CEU code is KY26QV, like Victor, KY26QV. And with that, Amy, I'll thank you again. Um, yeah. Much appreciated. And um, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the conference. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of the conference. You too.